Hey, Dessert listeners, we're coming up on our 14th anniversary show, and if you want to send us a card or a package or something that we open up during the live stream on September 17th and 18th, I think, it's that weekend, Saturday, Sunday, you can send things to 10002 Aurora Avenue North, Suite 36, number 214, Seattle, Washington, 98133, and let's watch. Asking permission. Yeah, I remember that class. Yeah. And you remember my response? I remember. I remember everything. So sometimes I go right. through that. Here, I'm going to give you this. Oh, thanks. Thank you so much, sir. Ah, brings a tear to the eye. So I don't know what he gave him, but maybe a ring or money or something. Maybe a ring. I don't know. But, you know, nice to see. Got to head him in the right direction. So? I appreciate so much. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. All right. I love you like a son. <laughs> so? Yeah, nice to see. You know, they're... It's just, you know, everyone loves a good wedding, right? <laughs> Even if it's Emily and Kobe. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I think on the scale of things. I wonder if this season got a little wonky because, by comparison, since I think a lot of the couples are actually doing pretty well. I know a lot of people wouldn't agree with that. I mean, Bilal and Shida, you've heard me talk about them, but I think compared to, say, Jasmine and Gino or Angela and Michael, these kinds of people, I think the six couples this, se- this season there wasn't really much there. In fact, you could wonder if a lot of what we saw was just kind of manufactured because the producers are like, we don't have anything here. We got to create something to happen. So I think Emily and Kobe have a lot of strengths, particularly after seeing Emily apologize. And of course, Kobe doesn't seem to really have any kind of issues that are getting in the way. So I think there's a pretty good chance that of, you know, as couples are, a lot of really good couples end in divorce after five, 10 years. So maybe that'll happen to them. But I think on average, they're doing pretty well. It's going to be a good day. I gave Kobe something personal that I wanted him to have that would remind him of what my letter said to him. It's a really beautiful thing. Okay, so it sounds like maybe a some sort of family heirloom or, uh, I don't know, interesting. I'm curious what they did. He didn't want the cameras to see it, which is fine. But, um, yeah, it's good to see. You know, toxic masculinity is a thing, and that means we're not supposed to have emotions. We're not supposed to cry. We're not supposed to um, have emotional conversations. And I think definitely Kobe is anti-toxic masculinity, and uh, at least the bits that we've seen, right? I mean, even when his friend is like, hey, you're the man, and African men, they're in charge. Kobe's like, okay, but I don't think he's on board with that perspective. I think he wants equal. I think he wants equality in the relationship. Um, But then we see the dad also issuing toxic masculinity as well by being vulnerable and crying and and caring. I I don't know if I showed this bit, but the father was like, it's your job now, (laughs) which I think plays into a narrative that many people have that Emily is a grown child and the father has been overly responsible because of Emily's under functioning for a long time and the father doesn't want to be in charge anymore and hasn't wanted hasn't wanted to be in charge for a long time and is now saying it's your job because you know there's a lot of messages that a father can say to the person marrying their you know their child um, you, you know, it's your job now is one of the things that a parent would say. I think a, another thing would be like, uh, you know, don't hurt them or um, you're a great person. I don't know. There's just a little, but you know, I think it's a particular message that he's giving. It really hurts not telling him about the pregnancy because right now I feel like he trusts me so much. <laughs> ah, you can do this. It's going to be like I failed him. And I am afraid that I might ruin everything. But I just can't take this anymore. He's going to tell him just before the wedding, like minutes before the wedding? I mean, yeah, 
uh, well, well, what'll happen here? <sighs> okay, well, so this is something that I don't get a chance to talk about, which is that Kobe right now is stricken with guilt. The father has given him a, a symbol of his care and his approval and his love for Kobe. And Kobe is now acutely feeling the guilt of oh, I'm withhold I've been withholding something from him this whole time. So when you feel guilt and you have information that the other person might want to know, you want to think about the full impact of revealing that and when you should reveal it. Now of course it would have been better if they had immediately told him as soon as they found out. That would have been the fair thing to do. Uh, depending. I mean, you could argue it's not really his business, but I don't know. I would think most people would think it is his business since he is taking care of them and that sort of thing. So, but if you did wait, then what do you do? A, a, a more common issue is if you cheated on your partner or a more commonly discussed conundrum. And should you tell your partner? Now, under most circumstances, yes, you should. But Let's say, hypothetically, there was a moment five years ago in which there was maybe not a full-on cheating moment, but you know something that sort of happened. And you are stricken with guilt. You're now realizing, oh, that I shouldn't have done that, and I should tell my partner. Well, there are different ways of approaching this. On one hand, it makes total sense that it would be a moral thing to do to inform your partner because to continue to not tell them is to lie by omission uh, for the rest of your life, which is essentially when you lie by omission, every day throughout the day, you are lying. It's important to recognize that people sometimes don't even think lies by omission are lies, but they are lies. And not only are they lies, but you are repeatedly lying for every minute that you could possibly be telling them. So. You could argue, you know, like in criminal law, when they're like five counts of uh, domestic assault or something like that. Well, to lie by omission that you cheated on your partner for five years, there's probably thousands of counts of lying. You know what I'm saying? So it's important to recognize that. So on one hand, it's not only the moral thing to do, but it'd also be important for your partner to know that they would want to know. On the other hand, and this is complicated, of course, and every situation is different. You might be telling your partner about the past transgression, not to benefit your partner, but to relieve yourself of the guilt, which is perhaps something to think about, but what if the overall uh, benefit versus disadvantage to your partner is highly weighted towards the disadvantages that your partner now suddenly is, you know, say for example, in this hypothetical, you were younger, you're immature, you were confused, and you had a moment where you did something wrong, you cheated on your partner, kind of, and you went through some therapy and you thought about it and you reaffirmed your relationship and you're no longer at risk of harming on your, uh, of, of uh, cheating on your partner. And you're pretty sure that that's not gonna happen again. Okay, so to tell your partner in that situation it's possible that your partner will now be thrown into a paranoia, perhaps for the rest of your relationship, perhaps for the rest of their life because of what you did. And now you're telling them. Now you feel better because you're telling them and you're, you're no longer guilty so you, and you're no longer worried about lying by omission. So that is a benefit to you. And your partner is benefited because they know and they're no longer being lied to and, and having more information helps them to make a decision about the relationship. But let's say that the trauma of learning about the infidelity is severe and makes them question everything for five, 10, 15 years, maybe longer about who they are, about their working models of self and other, about what the relationship means. And, and meanwhile, you feel better the next day and for your partner for the rest of their life or for the next 15 years, they are in a state of recovery. Was it worth it? If you ask your partner, would you have liked me to have told you, you know, most people would say, yeah, I, of course, I didn't want you to lie to me anymore. You need to tell me the truth. But a lot of partners will actually say, no, I wish this happened five years ago. 
yeah, I mean, I guess I would have wished you would have told me back then, but you waited five years. You might as well have just kept it to yourself because now I can't get it out of my head. I can't stop visualizing this. And and you say that you're no longer likely to do this, which I, I guess I kind of believe, but you telling me that you cheated on me, even though it was five years ago, I felt like I feel like it just happened today because you're telling me now I'm envisioning it in my head. And so it's complicated. So for Kobe, what's the what's the true moral thing to do here to lie by omission to the father uh, throughout the wedding ceremony is to accrue more counts of lying. Right. More, you know, you know, when I was talking about five, five counts of lying that you've accrued today. Well, he's going to accrue more. Well, he already has hundreds or thousands up to this point. So five more isn't going to matter that much, but it is something there. And the, the father probably wants to know and probably doesn't want to be continually lied to. Right. So on that, on that level, it is the moral thing, the ethical thing to tell the father. But what if it throws the father into such a funk that he is irritable and angry and cannot enjoy the wedding after he after Kobe tells him is resentful, maybe even has a, a big reaction, which would be understandable and storms out of the wedding and doesn't even participate in the ceremony. Then, you know, a week later, a month later, a year later, the father's like, oh, yeah, I probably overreacted. But why did he tell me? And, you know, minutes before going in into the ceremony, I mean, if he told me the next day, then I would have had my freak out the next day. Why did he tell me then? Or if he would have told me a week before, why did he tell me just before walking out basically on stage it, that I wish he wouldn't have done that? I wish he would have just continued. He, he, he did that because he felt guilty. He selfishly told me, you know, you'll, you'll hear people say stuff like that. So that's that's the ethical conundrum. And if I were Kobe's friend, I would say, if you have to tell him, if so, the, there's another consequence that if Kobe doesn't say anything, it could ruin Kobe's day because Kobe can't look at the father or can't live with himself. You know, um, the other consequence is that Emily isn't around for Kobe to talk with so that they can confer as to whether or not the father should be told. It could ruin Emily's day if, because the father could go to Emily and Emily could be like, what? You told, you know, and again, if it were another day, you would have some time to kind of un unravel this, but at, at a, just before walking on stage, you know, so I guess if I were Kobe, I would say, well, here are the consequences possibly that could happen. You could ruin the father's experience of the wedding, which could in turn ruin Emily's experience of the wedding, which could in turn ruin your experience of the wedding. Whereas if you just wait literally three hours, just wait until after the ceremony or 24 hours, then none of those risks are going to be taken. And the only risk that you're adding is that just one more set of 24 hours is added to the lying by omission period of time, which I don't think the father is going to resent. I don't think the father the next day is going to say, why didn't you tell me this last night when, you know, I gave you that thing? Like, I just don't think that will likely happen. Or if it did, would the consequences outweigh the potential risks that Kobe is taking now? Now, it's possible that Kobe tells the dad and the dad is like, whoa. But, you know, I guess another benefit to telling the dad now is that the dad is in a very good mood and is likely to, uh, you know, <laughs> it reminds me of this of this time when, uh, so there are two stories I'll tell you. <laughs> when I was a kid, I, uh, me and my friends, you know, so we went to McDonald's a lot. McDonald's was actually kind of fancy, or at least it was fancy for my family. After church, we would go to McDonald's in Issaquah, uh, just, just outside Seattle, uh, a McDonald's sort of, we knew we were a real town when a McDonald's franchise came to town because prior to that, there were just like one or two restaurants and no traffic lights. I came from, anyway, point is, is that when the McDonald's came to town, we'd go there and uh, uh, my parents, when we would go to McDonald's, that we would always run into other people we knew in the community and also other churchgoers, I guess. And um, but we'd be in our Sunday's finest, you know, we'd be in our nice outfits and everyone would be in our nicest clothes. And, we're, and I and I can still see it in my head that we would be sitting in these just regular 
McDonald's booths, you know, and um, thinking we're at a fancy restaurant <laughs> anyway. So I would have been, I don't know, eight, 10 years old. And me and my friends, we would get so bored because my parents would just have the longest conversations with the other adults. And we'd just be like, ah, oh, I'm so bored. What we? And this is before, I just missed it when they started adding those playgrounds to McDonald's. My little brother benefited from that, you know, ball pits and the slides and stuff like that didn't exist, or at least in the Seattle area until I'm just going to take guess like 82 or something. And I was a kid before that. Anyway, so we're sitting there and... One of the things that we like to do with my friends is we like to play with the ketchup packets to see if we could do something with it. You know, when you're in the 70s, you literally would make a toy out of a rock because there was nothing to do. There was no Nintendo or cell phones or anything or cartoon channel or cartoon network. So one of the things we would do is we would put the, uh, you know, the ketchup packets underneath people's car wheels and then we'd stand back and watch and wait for someone to come out of the McDonald's and get in the car and then when they drove over it the the ketchup packet would explode and that was high entertainment for us and so we're sitting there I'm and I'm I'm at the booth and my mom is across from me and you might see where this is going and I'm sort of playing with this ketchup packet and I'm thinking okay how do I get it to kind of almost burst but so i'm really working at it i'm just playing with it playing with it and my mom and dad are talking to somewhere sitting in the booth and then all of a sudden this tiny little uh, hole is created by me playing with the packet and i have so much pressure that the most glorious stream of ketchup just shot out of the packet an arc of of uh, you know uh, tomato paste and vinegar just goes flying across the table and lands right on my mom's really nice trench coat that she had. And like, it was like a, you know, a, a beige seventies trench coat, you know, like a, like a nice ladies trench coat. <laughs> it just goes right on it. And I remember going, Oh, you know, and my parents weren't abusive, but, they weren't soft. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> you know, there are four of us kids and uh, not a lot uh, uh, went unremarked. Let's just put it that way. And so I thought I, because I didn't do stuff like that. Very, I wasn't really a troublemaker. And so the, my life <laughs> passed before my eyes. But my parents, you know, and I could see my mom like get, a, a flash of rage. I mean, she wasn't prone to rage at all, but you know, it's just like, and we, again, we weren't rich. So that was an expensive jacket and I probably destroyed it, you know? And so uh, she's like, uh, and then she clamps down and she's like, Oh, Kirk, you know, <laughs> she wipes it off. And, and I'm like, wait, so, and then another five minutes, 10 minutes pass. I'm like, so I'm not going to get punished at all for that. And nothing ever happened as far as I know. And I made note of it then, but I didn't really understand it. Then fast forward, uh, uh, probably around the same time, me and my cousin are um, bored one summer again, no Nintendo, <laughs> no Cartoon Network, no internet. And so one of the ways we would entertain ourselves is we would just, I don't know, f do something that was interesting. And one, of the th one day on a summer day, we decided we would climb on top of my elementary school and so we're like well how are we going to do that and there were these big rain um, container sort of things these round things and so we put up we found like some scrap wood and then we got a garbage can a real rickety metal garbage can and put it on top of the wood that was straddling this big barrel thing and you know when i think back it's like the fact we didn't break our necks is just incredible we we climb up on the on the you know the top of this contraption and we climb up on top of the roof and now we're on the roof of my elementary school and we feel like we're on top of the world this is awesome you know this is high entertainment <laughs> and we're running around on the elementary school by the way sunny hills if you want to look it up on the spanish plateau uh that building doesn't exist anymore they tore it down long ago and built a a new new uh or at least i think so mostly new anyway running around and but you know we're so we're giddy we're eight years old running around oh my god what are we doing what are we doing and then we see a car come into the parking lot 
and we just immediately panic. And I think we thought it was the police or something, but it probably was just like some random person. But we panicked and we're like, okay, we got to jump. And without trying to find a good place to jump, we just went to the first place to jump with it, which was actually very high. You could argue it was two stories up. And so my cousin, because uh, kicks the children or no tricks, the uh, cereal tricks are for kids. One of the, it was a bunny and <laughs> sorry, this is a big tangent, but the, uh, my cousin, there was a commercial line that he said, feet don't fail me now. The, the bunny would say, feet don't fail me now. And then my cousin said, feet don't fail me now. And he jumped off of the elementary school and he landed and, and, and he was kind of hurt, but he was okay. But I didn't say feet don't fail me now. We, me and my cousin still talk about this today. I jump off the roof and I, I, my legs kind of get out in front of me, you know, a little bit. And I sort of try to compensate by bringing my feet back and my foot goes like straight into the ground and something snapped. And so I, you know, it hurts. I get up. I'm just like, oh, what did I do to my foot? And we have to get back home. We have our bikes. And so I'm, I can't ride my bike because my foot hurts so bad. So I'm, I'm just walking on one leg with my bike all the way home. And I don't really care about the pain. I don't care about the inconvenience. The only thing I care about is I'm going to get in trouble <laughs> because uh, now I think I've talked about in other videos how I didn't have or I will eventually. Uh, there's some videos coming out about Machiavellianism. And I basically talked about how I have uh, apparently no Machiavellianism in that I, I have no ability or propensity to sort of scheme against people <laughs> and to a fault. And it never occurred to me or my cousin that we could just say, I just fell. I mean, I think that's what most people would do is just be like, ah, I fell on my foot. Um, you know, we were playing and I, I landed wrong or something. It, that just never occurred to me. I've, I was like, well, of course, I'm going to have to tell my parents that we were on top of the roof of Sunny Hills and I jumped off and I hurt my foot. And so we we get back home. But my parents have guests over. I, it could have been my cousin's parents. I'm not sure, but I think it might have been random like neighbor people. And my dad was showing a um, film strip or a slideshow of uh, maybe Anyway, so they're showing that, and I remember walking in, and I, you know, my parents are like, "Oh, you're back," and I tell them the story, and I'm thinking, "Oh, I am so, I'm so busted. Like, there's so many things wrong with what I did. Why was I on top of the sunny hills? Why did I jump off? Why did I break my foot?" <laughs> you know, and I remember my parents are just like, "Oh, well, you know, well, well, you know, maybe put some ice on it, and we'll go to the doctor tomorrow if we need to." And I'm like. There was no anger. There was no punishment. There was no lecture. It was just matter of fact. And so after the second time that happened, you know, he had the McDonald's ketchup incident. And now the incident, I'm like, oh, I get it. When my parents are around other people, they actually will regulate to the point where if they don't react in the moment. And then the next day when they get around to thinking about it, they they're calmer and thus won't have any reaction to me <laughs> now again if i were more machiavellian i would have pl planned that out but i never did i never noted like oh, okay next time i did something bad I, I should tell them while they're with other people like i just i don't know I, I should have noted that but i didn't learn from that issue but anyway so it's funny when i, <laughs> I look back at kobe he just has this look like kirk really you've been on a tangent for how long like i've been i've been frozen here waiting for you to shut up so i can actually show the viewers what my decision is <laughs> so all that is to say that maybe if you tell the dad now and the mom i guess by extension because the wedding is happening the dad will clamp down on his initial reaction and give him a day and by then he'll be calm and he won't have a huge reaction. That's the whole point of my long tangent. That's why I want to tell David so much about this pregnancy. <sighs> but thinking of Emily as well, I feel like if I tell David now, I might betray her trust. Okay, good. Yeah, I think that's wise. Who knows what is the better option? It's. 
uh, lesser of two evils. Of course, it would have been better to have told him right away. But given that Emily had pressured him, Kobe, to not tell the father, then there's really no good answer to that. So he's deciding not to. This isn't, like, like I said, the best decision, but it's perhaps better than telling him just before the wedding. So, okay. Now that the wedding is over, is it time to tell the family your secret? No. Yeah. <laughs> it's just the perfect time. It's, this is something- Not today. This is something I've been waiting. You know, I've heard this, it's really heavy on me. I can continue living in your father's house, looking at him. Just relax, it's no, gonna like, be fine. It's, it's, it's Wait, sound look so, okay, you've heard me evaluate this sort of conversation before. She would be more healthy if she were to say, well, okay, I hear you that you want to do that. And I, a part of me absolutely agrees with you, but I'm worried about doing it now. Can we wait a couple weeks? You know, you have a reasonable negotiation or conversation, validate the other person. You can certainly assert what you want, but you don't have to shut the other person down. So she's saying, just relax, just relax. Now she could absolutely have an argument. It's like, don't ruin the wedding day. Just please, please, I get it. But tomorrow or something, let's talk about it later instead of just relax. Get at him. It sounds easy. And you won't feel bad. It sounds easy to you, but I cannot, honey, please. Mm. I just hope you can understand me. And we agreed on after the wedding. Yeah, so he is speaking from his emotions in a healthy way. He's saying, it's really hard on me. And I, I hope you understand that. He's not saying we should do it or there's something wrong with you that we don't do it. He's saying it's impacting me greatly, which makes total sense. He's lying by omission straight up to the father and the mother's faces. So, uh, and I'm, I'm guessing it's also hard for Kobe because he's like, this is all being documented. <laughs> The parents are going to watch this and they're going to know we were lying by omission the whole time. So anyway, he's speaking from a healthy place. And instead, she's saying, just relax. Like maybe the next day I'm going to tell him. And then she rolls her eyes. Now, he could probably... Now, maybe for Kobe, he's like, okay, now that we're married, I don't really care what your preference is. I'm going to tell the dad because I can't take it anymore. And... I, I, as a favor to you, I held out for months to not say anything, but I can't do that anymore. He should probably tell, you know, Emily that. See, I, I get it. I'm sorry, but I'm going to tell him I, I can't do it anymore. Uh, so he's just saying, I'm going to do it. And then she rolls her eyes. All right. Well, that does it for that episode. Everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.